Welcome to Deconversations, a rather excellent podcast if you're listening and a webinar if you're watching, discussing all things related to medical devices decontamination. Brought to you by Dan Cole, the instrument maker, Matthew Pescott, entrepreneur and former sterile services manager, and Pavel de sternberg Stylovsky, a research and development engineer. Welcome to the third episode of the Conversations. Delighted to have today with us our special guest, who is Jamie Russell from North Devon Hospital. And uh, Jamie is very unique, has a very unique position, which which caught my eye, and hence the reason why we were very keen to talk to him as a trainee sterile services department manager. Um, so we're going to run through, and we have a few questions we'd like to ask Jamie that. Hopefully, you can tell us a bit more about his sort of journey so far and, and and how it's been going for him. So, Pavel, please please lead the way. Yeah. So the first question we wanted to ask is how did you actually end up in decontamination? Because every person I meet that works in this industry has got an interesting story. It's it's not something that um, you just choose. Something must have happened that uh, that you are here with us. Well, yeah, definitely didn't choose it. Um, so. 2004 is when I got into decontamination. I just left college. Uh, I'd done business study, so nothing to do with decontamination. And my mum said, you need to get a job. She worked at the hospital. Uh, she worked in the maternity department. And it was back when you used to have to apply for jobs in the, no in the newspaper. You have them in the newspaper. You have to apply for them through there. Um, so I applied, got an interview, didn't really think anything of it. I'd applied for a load of interviews at that point. Um, and there was a woman, Joan Squires, who was a CSSD manager at the time, uh, took me on and I've been there ever since. And it was only supposed to be like a, a short term job for a couple of months. And 16 years <laughs> later, I'm still here. That, that sounds very familiar to, to, to Matthew's, uh, introduction into sterile services i think doesn't it matthew yeah basically so same situation uh, uh left school didn't have a job um my father said there's a temporary job in the sterile services at the london hospital Whitechapel. Uh, it was to cover a, a lady that was sick um and basically um i i was there for the year covering and she was supposed to be coming back she didn't come back and so I, I've stayed and I've been in decontamination ever since. So and that was 1983. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I need to retire, I think now. So. <laughs> Brilliant. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you found, you, you've been in the industry for a, a number of years and you're now in the position of training to be the sterile services manager. Um, from a point of interest to myself, um, and I'll just jump in and ask a question I was interested in, such a diverse department you know having to know about instrumentation maintenance of instruments condition chemistry sterilization what's a disinfectant right. how did you go about preparing to sort of learn that or, or you know I, I know you're in the state training management position now and obviously that has its own areas of managing people and stuff like that but how do you go about even begin to learn those, those things those those different components yeah well it's, like you say there's a lot to learn and um to be honest, when you, oh, oh, well, me personally, when I first started, I felt really bombarded with information. Um, just even just the inf instrumentation, you know, all the instruments that you have to learn, the various different specialities. I thought, you know, I'm never going to learn this. Um, and it's just one of those things through repetition. Um, uh, common sense almost in a way with instruments that you you do this the penny drops with me that's what it felt like is that just one day I sort of got it um, with regards to um, the sterilizers you know the the temperatures um, I've been to courses at Eastwood Park um, We've had um, people come in and do teaching with us, so I don't know. Don't necessarily think there's any hard or fast uh, rule 
with learning it. I think it's just, it's probably unique from department to department. There are services throughout the cost throughout the country, I'm guessing. So uh, one question that I had over here is, um, how long was it until you actually felt confident that you sort of understand how the whole machine works, how all the cogs are turning? Um, when, when did you sort of feel that, yeah, now I sort of see how, how this whole thing works? So when I started, um, as I said in the introduction, it was only going to be a tempor temporary job. And um, and I think one of uh, my supervisors had said, you know, it'll probably be about 18 months before you feel comfortable and you feel like you can do the job. You know, and in the back of my mind, I was thinking, that's fine. I probably won't be here in, in 18 months time anyway. Um, and it was probably it probably was about eighteen months, two years down the line that I thought actually I can do this, I can do this well, um, and I sort of understand the process and what we're trying to achieve here. No, so yeah, probably eighteen months, hmm. eighteen months, two years, I would say. I mean, I suppose it's with such a complicated thing. That's, uh, I guess. It's one of, it sounds like you've had a combination of experience, you know, learning from obviously the practical side of things. And also, I guess the courses, uh, Eastwood Park, obviously, as you mentioned. One thing I'd say, though, is I'd, I've seen you around a lot at, you know, the conferences uh, and sort of throwing yourself into that, putting yourself into the different sort of, you know, networking type groups and and visiting yeah. manufacturers. And uh, I, does, has that paid off to give you a, you know, more rounded um viewpoint on 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 the industry definitely um you know i don't think you can you can beat that sort of interaction with people and and what you'll find is that everyone's in the same boat everyone's got the same issues the same um complaints you know sterile services is such a unique sort of job and, and decontamination is such a unique field is that everyone sort of there's quite a community there and everyone's sort of um quite happy to to talk and and share information i find oh, that's great matthew i'd just like to bring you in if you have uh, a question that hasn't been asked so far that you think jamie could answer for us yeah um uh hopefully one of the questions that we sent you was uh regarding the IDSC. Hmm. Uh, I mean, are, are they supporting you in the training or or are there other sort of training bodies that are looking after you? So um, when I, so I've been, I, I got appointed to the post uh, just over three years ago and it was to it was to tie in with the retirement of the current sterile services manager at that time. Um, so part of the requirements for me to get um, in that post was the technical certificate. So I completed that a couple of years ago now. Um, the other training that I've had to undergo is a lot of the training at Eastwood Park, so um, endoscopy management, uh, steriliser and washers, um, signing off for those, so the management of those, the validation. The, oh, so it's bit the, the IDSC has had a part um, with the tech <clears throat> with the technical certificate. Um, but it hasn't been it hasn't been structured by the IDSC, no. So, so uh, did, did the hospital uh, organise any uh, training for you over, over and above what I did, the I there are services requires? So the hospital um, arranged uh, management qualifications, uh, internal and external, um, and just the networking as we spoke about earlier on, going to the IDSC, uh, NPAG, 
stuff like that where you are networking with other people and gaining more experience that way Dude, Jamie, um, oh sorry go on no, i was just gonna say jamie i remember you saying to me um you found yourself chairing an mpag sterile services yeah. meeting um, and yeah. just just uh, really which you weren't aware that you were supposed to be chairing and and that's I suppose a bit of a baptism by fire but that sort of thing I guess helps build your confidence doesn't it as, as yeah as a... yeah well that was that was quite funny to be honest because um I think it might have been one of the first or second times ever I'd gone to one of those the MPAG meetings and they needed a new chair or the chairperson wasn't there and they said, you know, it was a bit like being in school and said, we need someone to do this. And everyone's looking around going, well, I'm not doing that. And it, it was probably only for about two seconds, you know, the silence in the air. Um, but it probably, it felt like about 30 seconds. And I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. So I just put my hand up um, thinking that I was just covering it for the day. And then um, what I didn't realise is that I was, be, I was uh, putting myself off up to be the uh, permanent chairperson. <laughs> well, it's very good, very good of you to do so. But yeah, I'm sure it, anything like that, it's got to help broaden your yeah, your, absolutely. Your, your ability with people. Uh, Pavel, would... yeah, I was sort of because this is quite an uh, you know you're in a unique position at the moment, sort of uh, going through the different um, different areas in decontamination, also from the uh, management point of view, and I was. Um, sort of thinking if you if you comprehend the fact that you have on one side you have the technology then you have the the, the management and uh, the running of the of the entire department uh, which of those um, um, elements uh, do you find most challenging because what I wanted to sort of understand is when you look at progressing with uh, with your career is how, how, how do you look at it from the perspective of your own development Certainly, the, probably the most challenging part is is managing people. Uh, people are are um, everyone's different, and so you're always going to get inconsistencies in people's behaviour. Um, so that's probably challenging. Um, learning, you know, requirements for machines, machine validation. That's you know that's that can be quite daunting, and obviously it's a massive part of the job as well um so yeah i would say those probably two things sort of the managing people um and actually the 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 sort of technical aspects of sort of machine reports and everything like that i would find the most challenging yeah, yeah i just imagine it is quite <clears throat> quite daunting um and it's also you know a hell of a responsibility to ensure those machines continue to do what they what they what they should be doing. Matthew, sorry, I interrupted you. Please pick up with the with the point you were going to make a few minutes ago. Oh dear, I'm, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Can you remember what my point was? <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, Pat, well, <laughs> you had a question about future technologies in yeah service. so uh, i was sort of trying to to link this up because the the, the really interesting thing is that um healthcare in general is um uh, is experiencing unprecedented times i think in terms of the um, introductions of different technologies into pretty much every single aspect of uh, of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and i was sort of thinking whether you have that uh uh, one or two examples that you are really waiting for something to to come in and solve a particular problem. Um, I would certainly, I would say, some sort of um, really robust RFID um, for for tracking instruments uh, on trays, you know, for missing instruments. Um, coming back to the department after clinical use, I think that would be if you could, if someone could find a really robust uh, RFID traceability system for for that. I think that would be that would be really good. Uh, I, I think it's all about with all these new technologies. It's all about the balance between the cost, isn't it? And, and yeah, it being, it being practical. Um, I mean RFID 
seems like could be a great great solution for for, for that side of things um but yeah, Pavel, did you have anything in mind that you were thinking of that? Because I've some I, I've saw um, at the World Sterilisation Conference last year a robot that was wrapping trays, which I thought was, you know, fairly uh, uh, impressive and elaborate. But uh, you know, are we way off those sort of technologies, Pavel? Would you say? No, I think that this is the the, the critical element at the moment is to think about uh, what is really needed. And I think that um, it is, uh, you know, people like uh, Jamie who are going to to drive this because, uh, you know, th those are going to be the, the sort of um, the, the, the future of the departments. And uh, we are going to look at um, how we can implement different technologies to, to make things happen. And it also sort of ties up a little bit with what Jamie said about, um, you know, the challenges of, uh, of managing people. And I think that uh, we are in general uh, living in the age of automation. So uh, we are going to see more and more solutions um that uh, automate the, the repetitive tasks and wrapping instruments for example is one of those and uh, I, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that we we are seeing robots uh, taking over those elements like loading and unloading machines uh, managing the uh, internal logistics so uh, moving heavy loads uh, inside of departments so i think that uh, robotization is definitely coming um in, into that area and what we have to do is sort of uh, go along with that and and, and have a about think about um, helping out the, the technology with uh, with the way we sort out the management. So whenever we think about um, people inside of departments, we also have to sort of bear in mind in a couple of years, there's going to be this and that technology sort of coming in and how can we help people to work alongside those technologies um, a lot closer. So I, I, I see definitely a, a, a massive challenge in, in, in making sure that uh, um, I would say the new wave of, uh, of, of people who are managing and, and, and working in CSSDs that are going to be interacting with technologies a lot more in the future. So that's why, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's critical to, to look at those systems. Excellent. I, I'd actually, I was, I was trying to, I was wondering why the word robot are coming to my head, but I think subconsciously I've clocked that Matthew's got a robot wars poster behind his head on the, on the, uh, on the wall and that's obviously like somehow uh going to my head um no, i mean that is interesting technology and i'm sure things w will evolve um matthew is that is your your question come back to you yet or do you want us to move yes, on yes. well actually it's come oh, back uh, to a two-part question now um, <laughs> um jamie with, with regards to the training i mean obviously you're 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 uh you know, probably best qualified to answer this question. Um, do what are your feelings with? Um, uh, are there any holes in the, in your training? That's that's the first part of the question. So anything you think you feel that's lacking and needs a bit of work? And the second question is a bit more controversial because I like asking controversial questions. But uh, uh, do you feel that uh, the uh, industry are having to pick up too much of the the, the training with the various uh, institutes or, or training institutes that are, are very obviously um, promoting promotion of, of, of product? You don't um, have to answer that bit, Jamie, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to answer. <laughs> No, I'll, um, I'll give it a go. I'll give both a go. Um, so, to be honest, I suppose there's you don't rec realize you have a gap in your knowledge and until something happens. Sometimes, um, so at the moment, at the I've. There's not anything that I think, oh, I really probably need to know a bit more about that because the the sort of the nuts and bolts of the job, the sort of the the validation reports, the the stuff like that I'm having the the training for, I've gone on the courses for. I suppose it's probably more, as I said before, probably the the dealing with people and the experience that you get through sort of their everyone's different um, issues that they have in their sort of their own lives um, which might create sort of impact on their work there's probably stuff like that I would say which you you probably get more with experience 
Um, and what was the second question? Um, the the it's training. The, yeah. Well, the, the the fact that training is mainly offered by the commercial sector now. Uh, I mean, you do have Eastwood Park, which is you know fairly sort of neutral. I, I'm a big mm. fan of East Park and what they do. Uh, but you have these different uh, training academies set up by companies, uh, and then you go along, and you're you know they they give training, they issue certification, mm. they're all they're all above board and registered. But basically, I see it being cynical as a a, a product uh, placement and promotion. Uh, um, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, there definitely there definitely is um, there definitely is an aspect of that. Um, yeah, I don't. To be honest, I don't know what the solution is um, because obviously the information that these companies put forward is all is all leg like you say legitimate. It's um, it's all correct and everything, but there are they definitely is a slant um, for their own their own products. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know what the answer is. Um, when he's, the, he's I, don't, I was just going to say, I suppose. I think it's there's a definition, isn't there, between the formal training that you can have yeah. and going, uh, um, you know, somewhere like Eastwood Park that would be that would be uh, quite objective, and and then other companies, I think you you know will invite you along for a, you know what's essentially a visit to the company, isn't it? If you dress yeah. it up as a if you dress it up as a course or a university, ultimately once you're going into a company, you're going to get that company's you know viewpoint on. On the way things should be, but I think the important mm -hmm. thing is to do to go to lots of different things like that, so you get that overall. You know, and that's yeah. just my opinion. You get that overall perspective, don't you? Would you agree, Matthew? Then you get that. It's a, it keeps it balanced, doesn't it? Well, as long as the person attends attending the course realizes that you know uh, they might be uh, gaining something and learning something, as you do by, as you say, going to conferences and MPAG and being involved. Um, but as long as the person comes away thinking, okay, well. Uh, that's that specific company's viewpoint. Uh, maybe I should investigate the 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 other viewpoints because you know there's always uh, more than one way of doing something. You know, and and unfortunately they have the clout and the money to to be able to do that. Where smaller companies basically you know can be left at the wayside, and and that's what concerns me. Uh, I think the big companies should invite the smaller companies along. So you as a, a you know attendee feels that there's a little bit more sort of fair balance. Um, I mean, uh, this probably will get cut out, but um, uh, I've uh, tried to attend several of these meetings, either as a delegate uh, or as a, you know, uh, a speaker, and my um, my requests have always been declined. So. I, th I think you've got something there, Matthew, though. I think if they did, <laughs> Like if you if you did open it up to industry, because at the end, at the end of the day, they're not re revealing like all the, the secrets of the world. Like it would make the thing more credible, you know, if you brought other companies and if it is a bona fide educational thing. Um, but anyway, like mo moving on. Um, so, Pavel, I've got, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get back to, to the technologies uh, again and sort of think about uh, um, within your own role, um, you know, we talked about the general technologies that uh, you, you would welcome um, in in the sort of wider aspect of, of uh, the decontamination department. But I'm thinking specifically about uh, your role as a, um, as a manager. Um, what are the improvements that you are looking to implement, and what, in your opinion, would uh, would help you? um deliver um sort of more effectively what uh, what you are there to do um so um the, well i would say that you want to just carry on what's gone before you in that you want the job to be done to the highest possible standard um i mean that is the crux of the job to to make the end users, the uh, clinicians, feel safe, you know, with the the tools that they they're using, um, and it's going to get the best results for the patient. Um, I suppose 
the big uh, technology or is what Matthew's got a stake in is something like the pro reveal um, where you sort of, I mean, that is going to be the big, the big thing that we're looking to get um, to, uh, improvements on is the sort of protein detection. Um, and that is obviously going to have a, a good, um, well, not good. It's going to be, have a massive impact on the, the, um, the industry um, and obviously end users. I don't. To be honest, I would I would say probably the protein detection is the is the main thing. Which, if we can get that right, then um, that's going to make a hell of a difference. No, that's absolutely absolutely fantastic. And when when you talk to your your team, do they also um, every now and then come up with um, maybe suggestions or ideas? That, saying oh if we only had something that does this or that for us do, do you have that type of rapport with with your team that they can actually feedback right there from the um um from the sort of production set as say um to to, to to give you back that feedback so you can actually later on look at particular solutions yeah i mean we've got i've got a pretty open door policy um Trouble is with that is that you get quite a few people that are happy to to uh, suggest um, ideas that aren't always feasible. Um, we're lucky in our department in that we've actually had people that have worked in sterile services up and down the country, um, so they've they've seen other ways of doing things. Um, it's all money at the end of the day. It all comes down to money. Um, but yeah, I mean, I try, I try and be as open-minded as I can. Um, but money is the is the the main obstacle to to a lot of uh, um, improvements, really. Uh, this is this is a, a great point, and I think that in your particular case, the fact that you have um, um, sort of business background by education really helps to 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 make those judgments uh, right to see uh, where an investment is really going to uh, to pay off. Because th this is always uh, the the difficult part is where where you invest your money and what is going to to bring a return. So um, yeah, definitely kudos to. Uh, to you for, for for looking at it from from that perspective. So well done. Oh, that's that's great. Um, I have one of your questions that you haven't mentioned yet that you'd written down um, was about and Jamie, you just you just obviously we've just touched on your staff, but how do you communicate uh, around the importance of what they're doing relating to the operating theatre and the patient? Is it, is it a, yeah, I know you've yeah. got quite a close like close relationship with the theatres anyway, haven't you? So for your site, I suppose that's a bit more natural, but is, is that something yeah. that comes in? Yeah, so we are quite unique in terms of sterile services, theatre relationships, in that we are on each other's doorsteps. Now, quite often you'll to go to other sites and sterile services is, is down in the basement somewhere, hidden, you know, not you know, it doesn't even have its own uh, sign in, you know, as you go in the in the hospital. So we're quite unique in that we're placed directly next to theatres. Um, so we've got a, so we have, we have daily handovers um, with the staff for each shift. We have staff meetings on a weekly basis and we have a, um, we sort of have a, a sort of congratulatory board, you know, um, for if people have done gone above and beyond, we try and get fear to sort of to promote that. So if they, you know, it just, it, I think it it helps people realise that actually we do have a, a an impact on patients' safety and you know and and life changing surgery for people because um, it can be quite easy for us to just sort of look at it as a case of getting the, the equipment out of the department but when you do get that better bit of recognition it sort of make it makes you want to sort of go again and and do it again and and get that praise again 
That sounds excellent. So what what the congratulatory board? What 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 is that? You just tell us a bit more about that because obviously it's um, so it's just um, so we try and promote that with theatres to sort of um, you know if they feel that someone's given sort of excellent service or or you know turnaround times on a tight day have been you know met you know we've gone sort of gone above and beyond. That we just just like a little, uh, so we do a sort of cu customer questionnaire every sort of um, couple of months just to sort of get the feedback um, from the users and and sort of promote it on that sort of that platform with the the congratulations, um, you know, and allowing everyone to sort of see what what. Um, what impact we are having oh, that that's excellent and and it does sound like you know good rapport in the department and i can see why you know you might have been worked in there since sort of 2004 uh, why you know why why you've wanted to develop in the in the department as, as you have done and um, conscious that we've had obviously uh, of your time jamie have we got another question or final question for um for jamie that we'd like to ask guys um, if you had a magic wand, sorry, Matthew, go on, go on. No, no, go on. I like your magic wand. Go on. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I was thinking, I was thinking that uh, if you had a magic wand and there was uh, um, one thing that you could uh, get for your department, apart from the, not only from the technology point of view, but in terms of um, doing something to the department that would actually make the work in it um, a little bit easier, a little bit more pleasant for for everyone involved. Is there anything that you, you can think of? I know that it's a difficult question, but is there anything that you could sort of think of that that would be that one thing that you could actually come in and uh, and uh, and put there to to make everyone happy? Where do I start? Um, <laughs> I, I think, to be honest, um, we're talking about sort of robots earlier on. I think I don't think you can. I think you're always going to need that human element. Um, so I would say I would I would I would probably hesitate on replacing my staff with robots just yet. Um, probably just reliable machinery. I think that makes a, a massive difference. Um, if you haven't got machines that um, are breaking down, so if you could, if I could have washers and sterilizers and endoscopy machines that never break down i think i'll be happy <laughs> uh, uh, that's fantastic fantastic yeah. well um one one thing i've finally a uh, final thing i've written down on my paper was just basically you know how what you're doing or how your journey to become the, in, you know in the position you're in and uh, you know, going to be a sterile services manager is just uh, vocational training and how uh, you know that's a great example of you can also go sort of from out of school not knowing what you want to do and get into something that you didn't actually know existed um, and when I've um, done previously things with schools and trying to really enlighten kids that there are other jobs that they just didn't know and obviously you're involved in something that you really um, you're really passionate about and you've thrown yourself into so yeah it's really, really commendable but you know, thank thank you very much for answering our questions um, of course and for your time is there anything else you'd like to add before we before we go um no just thanks for uh, inviting me on you know it's certainly uh, i didn't expect to be doing a podcast 16 years ago on decontamination so <laughs> <laughs> neither did i <laughs> no no i think we're all the same on that one brilliant all right well thank you also had a question so uh, i don't want to cut him off before sorry matthew the, yeah go on no, no, no. It was um, just, just uh, you know, uh, I, I, with 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 Dan. Uh, thank you for joining us. It, it's great to see that there's still uh, trainee managers in sterile services. I think my concern is that the uh, a lot of the sterile services managers out there uh, are starting get getting to an age now uh, where they, you know, they're probably contemplating retiring. And unfortunately, there's not enough of people like you, you know, uh, on on the, mo moving into those positions. So congratulations, and you know, um, 
if you're willing to travel around the country, I think you'll have your pick of jobs uh, when <laughs> in the next couple of years. So, so just, uh, I mean, uh, that. So that is an interesting point. And how do how do we attract more younger people into into this department, Jamie? You know, what what would you say to them to you know say to people who are looking for a career in in uh, healthcare and it might be something a bit different? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, again, like anything, it comes down to, to money, doesn't it? Um, it's it's not a job that you can. It's not a job I knew existed. Put it that way, um, and I sort of stumbled upon it. Um, so there certainly needs to be there needs to be promotion of the job. Um, how you go about doing that, um, I don't know. But then it certainly needs to promote itself a bit more. Um, and then it, if you know, pay it needs to pay, pay to attract people that are looking for, you know, a new career. I suppose. Um, no, I think that's a good message. Yeah. No, I mean, maybe the IDSC should take the lead on this and start visiting unis, uh, because mm. I mean, you know, um, a career in sterile services uh, is not. Is not a bad career, and it's it's no. pretty well paid. you know, considering some of the other jobs uh, that uh, individuals get after uni. So maybe the IDSC should do like a roadshow around the unis. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've you know they've done they've done well to start to raise the profile, but I think it is it does need that continuation of and feed of people coming into the industry and maybe picking and up communicating this communicating this yeah. to to people because still you know uh, each each single one of us uh, whenever we talk to people we don't know we really have to explain uh, what the contamination is all about because it's not one of those things that everybody knows about so i think that if we communicate that and i think that uh, there are two aspects at least from from my perspective that make it uh, really interesting is the science aspect on one hand and then you also have the engineering aspect because uh, everything that we do over here you have more and more of uh, uh, engineering and, and, and science going into it so i think that there are there are new career paths and i think this if we communicated that properly uh, would uh, would attract people because from from that perspective this um, uh, this field is, is is really interesting and very unique yeah, I think it's like it is that voc you know, real sort of vocational hands on stuff that they could probably look at people who have been successful in the industry and, and look at the traits they have and what skills they have and, and match those to to people looking to train and get into work. But I'm I'm sure we could talk for hours on this. So thank you very much for your time. It's been really, thank really you very interesting. Much. It was fantastic. And, uh, thank and, you. Uh, hopefully Thanks we can get you get you back on a, a future episode at some stage. So um but much appreciated, Jamie, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. You have been listening to Deconversations. Join us soon for new episodes.